$56,000 to purchase a gram of radium, which they gave to Marie Curie for her research. Her daughter continued that research for a while, and the money that was left over was used to start the Marie Curie Postdoctoral Fellowship. The psychologist uh, Dr. Joyce Brothers, the author Susan Sontag, and the astronaut Judith Resnick have all been recipients of an AAUW fellowship and grant. Those women and the ones that we're here, we'll hear today are funded by simply the interest from AAUW endowments. In other words, only the interest is used so the endowments last in perpetuity. That's why AUW in the past couple of years has been encouraging members to give unrestricted donations. The idea being that the money will be used where it's needed most at that time. So all of our programs under the AAUW fund, Legal Advocacy Fund, the Leadership, Public Policy, all are funded with new money. As the money comes in, the money's spent. Even the Legal Advocacy Fund, which is the next most funded after the fellowships and grants. So they'd like you to send your money unrestricted. If you prefer a certain grant or program, you can certainly still donate to that. You just need to remember to designate the grant or fellowship or project number on your check so it goes to where you'd like it. TechTrack falls under the Educational Opportunities Fund now. American fellowships are awarded to scholars completing doctoral dissertations, doing postdoctoral research, or preparing that research for publication. They must be American citizens or permanent residents. The first American Fellowship was awarded in 1888 to Ida Street. She was an expert on early American Indian history. Um, good morning, or I guess it's good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for oh, thank you so much for being here, and it's an honor, obviously, to be here. And um, it's the first time I actually receive a fellowship like this. Oh, closer. Okay. Um, so. Um, uh, I'm a bit nervous about it, even though I've been doing public speaking for many, many years. Uh, it's the first time I receive such an honor. So thank you again for being here, and thank you for making this happen. It's um, it's truly an honor. Loud? Okay. Uh, so again, my name is Dina Adib. I'm a PhD candidate. Um, I'm ABD, which means all but dissertation. So I'm done with my coursework, my exams, um, and supposedly focused only on writing, but like. Um, uh, Mariel said that I have an eight-month-old baby, so I'm a little bit busy with her as well right now. Um, my research focuses on the 2003 U.S. invasion of Iraq. Loud, closer. Okay. Okay. There we go. Uh, 2003 U.S. invasion of Iraq, uh, actually starting with 19th century British uh, imperial presence in Iraq, uh, but the focus is the 2003 U.S. invasion. I look at the systematic targeted cultural destruction of uh, heritage sites as well as cultural centers like universities, museums, um, 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 religious sites, uh, as well as cul cultural heritage sites, uh, Babylon, Sumer, uh, seven cultural sites, uh, cultural heritage sites. I look at, for example, for the, with the cultural heritage sites, how there's been seven military bases, US military bases set up on, on top of these cultural heritage sites. For example, Babylon, which probably most of you know, um, is one of the most, it's, it's a 5,000 um, year old um, heritage site, and um, a US military base was set up right on top of that site, uh, and, and six others uh, similarly. So you can imagine the destruction that uh, that specific site had endured. Um, um, I also look at museums and other cultural institutions, universities, uh, high schools, louder? Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Um, and so the systematic targeting of these institutions, like what does it mean both for the short term and the long term? I also look at how you know, the, the, the vacuum in power created a black market that also um, forced a lot of these objects in museums or in these heritage sites to be looted and, and, and end up, actually it's very interesting because a lot of them both end up in, in American European museums as well as uh, private collections and museums in the Gulf, right? So then from there I look at the global economy of what does it mean to, to um, be investing in, in these objects, right? What does it mean um, from a you know, circulation point of view, from a consumption, uh, from a cultural representation, and, and so the circulation, the consumption, and 
and the distribution of these objects. Um, I also look at how um, the vacuum of power created uh, groups like ISIS and other groups that have also uh, contributed to the destruction from a different point of view or vantage point, and how some of these intersect. A lot of these um, uh, these groups have a lot of, in, um, I guess, uh, interests both with the Iraqi government, the U.S. government, the military. So you, I look at the intersection of how these different groupings come together and actually at different moments have collaborated and sometimes actually, you know, um, fought against each other. And how, you know, but the focus is really about these objects or these sites and how they're being, um, I guess, uh, contested over by all these different powers. Uh, and finally, I look at um, how cultural producers are dealing with these issues, right? Mostly um, I focus on Iraqi contemporary visual artists and um, how they're dealing with the issue of destruction of heritage sites. Um, I, I do comparison with Palestine, with Syria, with other sites, but mostly it, I focus on, on Iraq. So that's the, nut, you know, the nutshell of my research. I'm also a visual artist, and as a visual artist, I, I deal with, um, with the same issues, issues of war and destruction and, and um, memory and trauma and how does one, um, at, both as a collective and as an individual, uh, attempt to narrate these stories, these marginalized stories. Uh, so that's what I do as a visual artist. I've also been an activist for you know 20 something years now, uh, mostly working with uh, marginalized groups, women groups, girls, um, everything from um, macro to micro. I, I've done anti-war work um, as well as racial justice. Um, uh, you know, I, mostly intersectional work. You know, the intersection between race, gender, class, um, sexism, um, homophobia. You know, most of the isms, right? Imperialism. Um, um, and uh, I guess something personal that is interesting. Um, so this work for me is not just obviously just research and it's not just you know, um, uh, about the activism or about the art, but you know, I've had the lived experience that kind of brought me to this point. I'm from Iraq, uh, I came to the US in the first Gulf War in 1991, and it's really, um, I guess, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, uncanny, because when we came here, it was not by choice, obviously, it was during the war, and we ended up actually, we had friends, um, who lived here in San Ramon. So when we first arrived, we arrived here. Um, and it's just very, you know, it's so random from Iraq to be, you know, at the, you know it's, it's the end of the world, right? It's at the end, you know, it's, this is the end of, uh, so it's for me to show up at San Ramon in 1991 and here 20 something years later, um, I'm doing, you know, doing this research and I'm, you know, standing in front of you, sharing with you my, my work, both, you know, um, is about my work, but it's also really very personal and, and very, um, um, yeah, it's very personal and it's also about kind of who I am really intrinsically inside. It's not just the work that I do on a daily basis and think through, but emotionally very tied to it. Um, and now I have an eight-month-old baby that um, also is, is a privilege to be at this point while, I'm, you know, while I you know, give birth to a child who, who I never thought I would have a baby. I'm 42 next month and I never thought I would have a child because of all the you know, years and you know, war and, and trauma that we endured that I thought that I would never bring a life to, to this world. And, you know, and, and invest in that way. Um, so it's very interesting to kind of come to like a circle, I guess not full circle, whatever. It's, it's maybe not a circle, maybe it's just some, um, I don't know. <laughs> but you get the point. The point is, you know, to be here at this juncture in my life, it's really an honor to, to be supported in this way because um, I never thought I'd be here. So um, thank you so much. I'm Kit Hein. Um, Marie started this off, so okay. Um, I am a member of Pleasant Hill Martinez Branch, Santa Cruz Branch, Roswell, oh no, North Fulton <laughs> County <laughs> Branch, <laughs> and a former member of Hong Kong Association, so there. Um, I am honored to introduce Chloe May Legal Scoville who is an American fellowship recipient whose dissertation explores the ways in which 19th century French and English literature engages with imperial discourses about race and gender. And I'm gonna let Chloe tell you the rest of that, um, or explain that for you. Um, Chloe grew up in San Francisco. Her mother is French and she attended the uh, French American school. Her family still lives there. She's at Davis right now doing her graduate work um, in comparative literature department. Um, she has two older brothers and 
I think I found out something else interesting about her. But it's been um, lovely sharing lunch with her, and now I'm going to let her tell her story. Hello, and thank you for having me. Um, as Dina said, it's been a great honor, um, and I've really enjoyed lunch and chatting with people. Um, so as Kit said, I'm from San Francisco, and I want to give a brief sort of family history because it actually relates to the kind of work that I do. Um, as she said, my mother is French, but she's also half Vietnamese. So my, her father was a French um, colonial bureaucrat who went to Vietnam just before World War II, and he met his wife there and took her back to France and had 10 children with her, one of which was my mother. And then on my father's side, post-World War II, um, my grandfather from upstate New York went to the Philippines where he also met a wife and brought her back. Um, and then my parents met at UC Berkeley, so here we are. Um, so I'm interested in the legacies of colonialism and imperialism, obviously because I am here in large part because of them. Um, I'm interested in the ways that race and gender um, interact with empire in the 19th century, uh, particularly in French and English literatures. Um, my work, my dissertation, which the fellowship is supporting, um, looks at the new subjectivities that are produced by this colonial encounter. Um, so I'm looking at mixed race subjects, um, Creoles, by which I mean uh, people of European or African descent um, who are born in the colonies. So the most famous example I think is from Jane Eyre, Bertha, the mad woman in the attic. Um, so I'm writing one chapter about uh, Jane Eyre and also a French novel, Indiana. Um, and there I'm arguing that, in the English example, and I think people are probably fairly familiar with Jane Eyre, um, that being Creole is associated with corruption, with slave owning, um, and sort of with the negative consequences of colonialism. Um, while in Indiana, the French novel, um, it's a little bit more nuanced. Um, the Creole, uh, while you know, benefiting from slaveholding often, because if you were a white person born, um, in a slaveholding colony, usually that meant uh, you were benefiting from it, right? Um, there's a sense in which, for in Indiana and in Georges Sand's novel, uh, Creole actually is part of the sort of anti-slavery movement. She, and the, um, to spoil the end of the novel, um, works at uh, rescuing slaves, actually. Um, so it's more of an abolitionist uh, sort of meaning to the term Creole. Um, and so, as I said, I also work on mixed race representations in 19th century literature. Uh, so the Joseph Conrad's first novel, for instance, has a mixed race heroine. I mean, this is something that I'm arguing has been sort of understudied, um, certainly in that novel um, and in other texts as well. Um, particularly that example where it's a very sort of different depiction of mixed race people who are normally um, sort of, especially women, overly sexual, um, and uh, sort of not proper, and, and so um, and this example actually is very different, Conrad's, where she's very strong, she ends up leading a rebellion or helping to lead a rebellion. Um, it's a very interesting characterization there, so I'm sort of contrasting that with the typical representations. Um, I'm also looking at women authors, um, in particular one uh, writer who I've gone and done archival work on is Claire de Duras, a French writer from the early 19th century, um, and she wrote a novella which is from the point of view of a young black woman growing up in Paris um, in an aristocratic household, and she's been saved from slavery. Um, but, and so, but she doesn't realize that she's any different from any of the other sort of nobles that she's surrounded with until it comes time for her to marry. And she realizes that you know, she will not be allowed to marry within her class. Um, and this leads to sort of a melancholy that she can't explain to anybody. Um, and she ends up dying of her melancholy. Uh, but it's a very sort of unique text, as you can imagine. Um, it's one of the first, perhaps the first text written from the point of view of a black person in French literature, um, which alone you know, makes it very unique, but by a woman writer who's only sort of recently been rediscovered. Um, and it was actually one of the most popular novels of the 1820s, so it's very worth, I think, revisiting. Um, and I did work on her letters and journals and also an undiscovered or recently discovered um, unpublished novel of hers that was at Harvard. So um, that's this kind of work that I'm doing with the funding from the AAUW, um, which I'm very grateful for. So I think uh, that's pretty much what I'm going to do with the dissertation. Okay, thank you.
Um, for those of you who don't know, the uh, Tech Trek STEM camps were originally funded with a grant from the Educational Foundation, as it was called then, too. So I've got lots of reasons to be grateful for that. <laughs> but it's my honor today to, to introduce you to Carrie, Connie One, who is an East Bay product, so to speak. She came, was born two years after her parents immigrated here from Vietnam, and she was somehow able to navigate the educational system and uh, went to San Francisco State for her undergraduate, got her PhD from Cal at Berkeley, and has done some postdoc work that she'll tell you about so that she's seen a little bit of the world. But she's now using her fellowship this year and her postdoc at Mills College. Her PhD focused on race, gender, and violence and its effect on the education of young women. And her focus now is similar, but it's moving also into the impact of those traits uh, with social media played into it. So Connie, come and tell us. Good afternoon, about everyone. Hi. How are you? Um, thanks, Marie, for the introduction. She did a really good job listening to our conversation and paraphrased everything. Um, and thank you, AAUW, for the fellowship and for the support. I really, really, really appreciate it. Um, life is really hard as a, even if you, you know, as a postdoc, you're always trying to figure out how to make things happen. Um, so just real briefly about myself, um, just as Marie said, I uh, was born here in the Bay Area. I was actually born in Oakland, so I'm an uh, Oakland native. I was born in Highland Hospital, so yay, people are excited about that. I am too, actually, very proud of that. Um, it's a great hospital. Um, and my family's from East Oakland, and then I also uh, was a little bit of a transfer student um, in Union City, California, where I went to James Logan High School. Yeah, so I see some nods, people know where that is. Um, so I'm fortunate enough to have been able to kind of live um, through many things in life. Uh, and all of the, the kind of personal experiences of being a firstborn, you know, Vietnamese, girl here in the Bay Area it was a little bit difficult, I'll have to say. Um, and being poor working class was also quite difficult. Um, and I was fortunate enough to somehow get myself to college, not knowing what I was doing there. Um, and then I ended up finishing that. And at the time, I, was, I also became a sexual assault counselor. Um, and then I found myself getting a master's degree in women's studies. I told myself I, I wanted to be a high school teacher, but I didn't know enough, so I had to go get a master's degree. <laughs> Overachiever. Um, <laughs> and then eventually I, I became a high school teacher. Um, I taught English, I taught um, ethnic studies, I taught um, women's literature, so that was also really great. And then some things happened there, and I said, oh, I don't know enough. <laughs> so <laughs> I went and found myself in graduate school. And I pursued, you know, a PhD in education, where I study race, gender, um, school violence, actually race, gender, violence, um, and school discipline, and its effects primarily on girls of color. And it was there that I learned that girls of color, specifically black girls, um, are overly, are overpunished um, and definitely underserved. Um, and there's a lot of stuff that these girls are going through um, at home, on campus, in the community, and these things are very rarely addressed, which affects what happens at school, in the class seat, you know, and then their dynamics with teachers. So what the fellowship has provided me an opportunity to do is uh, actually I have a publication. I've been working on a publication that's coming out, I think, next month um, in race, ethnicity, and education. So I somehow found myself with a publication. <laughs> Um, and then I also was just recently asked to write for our Harvard Educational Review on that study. So I've spent some time, thanks to the fellowship, to, to write. So I'm grateful for that. Um, and then I'm also, now that I'm you know, finishing up some writing, I am um, spending some of that fellowship time to start my second project, which adds in the dimension of social media um, and surveillance. So a couple things that I found so far, which may or may not be interesting to you guys, but I hope it literally is little bit. Um, 
So I do interviews with young girls, uh, and I'm finding out that social media is not as exciting as, as we would hope for it to be. A couple of things that are happening is that young women are, um, you know, they're, they're, I'm sure you guys know this, right? So there's some, you see videos of young women um, without their consent being circulated. That's happening a lot more. Um, and the young girls don't really know what to do with that. So that has effects on their classroom environment. Um, and then, and the things that, that, that are happening online are not exactly the positive things um, that we'd like. So I'm studying that. Um, and then I'm also learning that um, the girls are using these social media platforms to do good things. You know, um, Marie and I talked about they're starting their own campaigns, online campaigns. They're like this dress code policy at school is really not fair. How can we get in trouble for wearing these dresses and the boys get to do all these things? So they're creating all, you know, they're, these campaigns. So they're using it for agency, like political agency at like 14 years old, which is great. Um, and then I'm also learning that they're being surveilled um, by different uh, corporations. So one thing that I learned, which you know, I'll probably end with as an example, is one of the girls that I you know, did an interview with, they um, told me that they, she had gotten in trouble because she posted her test scores on one of the standardized tests, from one of the standardized tests, posted it on Facebook. And somehow, the testing company knew that. So they have this, some type of surveillance system, and they contacted the school and they said you need to tell this student to take that off of her Facebook because that's our property. Yeah, isn't that so interesting and frightening? And so, of course, a school calls the child in and she gets in, they have to contact the parents who had, you know, prohibited her from having a Facebook account. Yeah, and so it spirals. Um, so, of course, she gets disciplined on different fronts. So we have no idea what to do with the social media kind of beast, um, and a lot of people don't either. And so that's what I'm trying to study, go into detail about, you know, doing some, some analysis around that. And I want to thank AAUW for supporting the process. So that's it. Thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm Holly Sauer. I'm from the Danville Alamo Walnut Creek Branch, and I have the great honor of introducing Maria Torchinanova as our career development. <laughs> I, I think I pronounced it right. I'm very pleased. Um, Maria is working on a master's degree in both public policy and social welfare at UC Berkeley. And it is like two majors, or two masters combined into one. So she is very, very busy. She does like, enjo like to enjoy reading fiction, but the interesting thing is she doesn't have much of a chance. She's busy reading policies, so she is very busy. Um, Maria was born in the Ukraine, and her focus at Berkeley is on sex and labor trafficking, which is a very critical, important area, and we're very glad that she is working on that. So here is Maria. Oh, I'm so excited to be here. Um, thank you so much for having me. This is truly, truly an honor, as some of the recipients have already mentioned. So I will take you back to a Thursday evening last April, where I was trying to make a really important decision. I had just gone into the Goldman School of Public Policy, and if I had taken uh, their acceptance, then it would add another year to my already existing program in social welfare. I really wanted to attend because it's going to give me the skills I needed, um, policy analysis, how to recommend policy, how to read it, all that jazz, right? But the problem was that I had also a really hard time justifying taking out uh, going to school for another year basically without an income and living in the Bay Area, which I have found out to be ludicrous. <laughs> so my heart was, you know, saying do it this is the right thing to do, and then my bank account was crying and saying no, like Marie, you literally can't do this. Um, and my family and friends were also divided, mostly because they didn't know what social welfare was to begin with, and now I'm adding on public policy, and they're like, what the heck is that? Why aren't you in law school? <laughs> so I said, universe, oh my gosh, give me a sign. I need to know what to do. So that night, at 7 p.m., I get an email, hours before I had to make this decision at midnight, I get an email from AAUW announcing that I received the grant. <laughs> I mean, I was so excited, I can't even believe it happened, it was just, you know, wow, it was, it was so amazing. 
So the grant not only let me go to Goldman, but it also let me become, um, take a position as a researcher at the Human Rights Center at UC Berkeley at the law school. So there I'm part of a team that's putting together a two year long project uh, looking at sex and labor trafficking in California, which has been my focus area for the past four years. So as I'm doing quantitative things over at the Goldman School, which have both been terrifying and pretty much impossible to understand, I'm also doing research on gaps in witness protection for survivors of trafficking. So right now, if I, as a survivor, want to testify against my trafficker, there's a good chance that I'm either going to get threatened, killed, or, well, actually, after killed, it's pretty much over, right? Um, <laughs> and how can I, as an advocate or a social worker or a lawyer, tell my client to go through with this when the danger is so great? The other area that I'm looking into is shelters for this population. Um, both emergency shelters as well as long-term care. So uh, last year I did a report at the San Francisco Department on the status of women that basically looked at all the victims that have come through San Francisco for the year of 2015 and the report is just being published right now. It's over 500 and that's that's just in San Francisco. So that's not Oakland, it's not Berkeley, that's not anywhere else. And there's nowhere for these people to go, is the problem. There's a handful of beds here or there um, that are also in appropriate placements. So you have children, minors that are going through this, but where are you putting them? You're putting them in shelters for you know, homeless youth, and they've already experienced so much trauma, and you're putting them with an unstable population. So basically, this grant, back, back to the good part, <laughs> Has, um, it's really been humbling, humbling to receive it because I admire AAUW so much already. I knew about the organization beforehand. And it's done so much for women and girls and continues to do so much. And then here you all are uh, choosing me and choosing my work and saying that it's important enough to invest in. And that's really the biggest compliment. And I promise to pay that forward. So thank you so much. My name is Liz Bathgate, and I'm a member of the <clears throat> excuse me Hayward Castro Valley branch. And some of you may have seen that sign that we were having our picture taken in front of. We gave fifty-seven thousand seven hundred dollars to charting the course over this year. So they sent us a check, fake check, so we could have our picture taken with it. So that's what we were doing earlier on. I'm really pleased to introduce this wonderful young lady, Anasola, her last name is Kushimo. Her parents came from Nigeria 40 years ago, her dad did, and she was raised in New Jersey. She went to the University of Maryland where she studied at the Clark College of Engineering, and she got her degree in 2014. Then she came out here to Stanford and did one year at Stanford getting a mechanical engineer master's, and now she's funded by AAUW to get the last year. And I don't know if all of you realize, but I think you mentioned it, that it takes a number of different fellows' monies in order to supply one person with enough money to be able to live without having to work. So there's three of us that are on this particular one. In addition, she has very interesting career goals she wants to get her master's, maybe go on and do some other work in between, working toward seeing about doing a startup. She's in the right place for that, over on the other side of the bay. She may go back to work, back to school and get a master, a business master's, and then go on and get a PhD. But she has a really interesting thing that she loves to do, and that is she loves poetry. So she does poetry what do you call them? Slams? That's a contest, which she's won many of. But she also d did a contest in just regular poetry where she read someone else's poem at Stanford this year, and she won first place. So she's got lots and lots of different talents. Hi, everyone. Hi. <laughs> Thank you all so much to echo what everyone has already said. I can't express how much this fellowship truly means to me. And thank you so much, Liz, for that wonderful introduction. I think to put everything in perspective, I'm also going to do a slight flashback 
into last year. So I actually came into graduate school, particularly Stanford, with absolutely no funding. And if you know how much it costs to, to live in this area and also to go to graduate school, it's an exorbitant amount of money and I had no idea how I was going to pay for it. And I think one of the things that really got me through that, that challenging, um, almost this like mental exercise of choosing to go to a school that, that didn't have any funding for me over other schools and opportunities that were willing to fund me was one, having the, the belief in myself that I was going to figure out a way through all of this, and two, also the belief that so many other people had in me. And so I feel like that's also where AAUW comes in. So my first year of graduate school was really, really challenging, partially because of the funding aspect, but also because of a really troubling experience that I had um, around January. And so I was distraught, I didn't know what I wanted to study anymore. I really started to lose sense of who I was or, or even felt as a person. And I had applied for so many fellowships and grant opportunities and was, and was losing faith in myself that maybe I couldn't pull all this off and I didn't know um, really where else to go. And it's funny, um, around the time that they sent the, the decisions for, for people to accept the fellowship, I'd already assumed that I didn't get it. Um, and I was, at a point where I had to think a few more days before I could figure out whether or not I, I was even eligible to accept the AAUW fellowship anymore. And they sent me a reminder email, and that was when I realized in May, I think four days before the deadline was to accept it, that I had even received it. And I can't explain the level of overjoy that I felt or just how, how affirming it feels to, to have gone through a year of constantly going to the department, of going to different professors, of, of getting assistantships, working as a TA, working on campus, virtually finding any job in any way of making money that I can so that I can fulfill my dream. Um, to have a group of women, a group of people, supporters saying, we believe in you, we see what you're doing, and we want you to keep doing it. So I want to thank all of you for all the work that you're doing around the state nationwide to support women like me in whatever field and careers that we're, we're trying to pursue because truly, um, and I don't want to get overly emotional because I'm a very emotional person, I'm a poet, um, but, but it really did um, touch me so deeply to have complete strangers have so much faith and so much belief and want to put their financial support behind me. I think one thing that I'll talk about Related to what I want to do in the future, I know it sounded a little bit fuzzy, so just to, to give some more context to that, this past summer I got to work on large-scale 3D printing, and if you're not familiar with 3D printing, we're basically able to take, if you can think of just a basic inkjet printer, rather than printing words on a page, we're now able to print material onto a platform, and with that we can build things up a layer at a time. And so we found a way to 3D print things using bamboo. And what I'm really interested in is can we take other sort of waste streams and agricultural wastes, like maybe um, coconut shells or rice husks or corn husks, and turn that into 3D printing material and start building things in the developing world. So not only are we building things cheaply and sustainably, but we're also building them very quickly for people that need them most. So I'm really interested in pursuing this work, figuring out if there's a way to, to turn this idea into some sort of startup and also hopefully pursue it for research um, later on in the future as a dissertation and become, um, and become an academic and a scholar and also another person who can encourage other women and really other people to pursue this field in the future. So again, I want to thank all of you so much for your support and if you are interested in hearing any poetry, you can talk to me afterwards and I can give you some YouTube links or even do you know, a mini performance, but yeah, I'm, it's my passion, it's something I love to do, it's helped me through all of this process and I'd love to share it with, with any of you. So thank you. Fortunate to have a Nick Whistle student with us today. That's the National Conference for College Women Student Leaders. It's held in uh, near Washington, D.C. every year at the end of May. It's a wonderful conference. I was fortunate to attend the opening uh, banquet this past May, and I was just overwhelmed with the energy and enthusiasm and um, the wonderful young women that were there. So we're going to hear from one today. And each year, is we try to find a person who is in the leadership position at the college. So this young lady has been in leadership at Chabot, Col Chabot College. 
this past couple of years that she's been there. She's not an American. She comes to us from France. She has been studying. Now I've forgotten all the things you just told me. I'm going to let her tell you. Because I, did, I went to Nick Whistle, too. And I was back there when she was there. And I spent an entire day and came home on an airplane with Jennifer after she'd been there. And she had a very interesting time. But I'll let you tell them about it. OK, Jennifer? Hi, uh, my name is Jennifer, so like Lee said, um, I was the recipient of the Nick Whistle Scholarship, so thank you all of you for that. It was a really nice gift to me. It's been a great experience. So for the background, uh, I've been a student at Chabot College since 2011. I have three majors, uh, international relations, political science, and early childhood development. Um, I'm interested in working um, with children and um, raise awareness and advocate for early childhood development. So that's a track that's a little bit complicated because nobody's doing it before me. So I'm kind of like trying to find my way. Um, I've been working as a student assistant at my college. I've been um, a secretary for the student senate. I've been working in shared governance um, with the other fellows, faculty members and stuff at uh, Chabot. And I was also secretary of the economics club. Um, it's been very busy. The year was very chaotic for me. And uh, it's like a country. It's not my country. I'm always like just trying to adapt to the culture and everything. It's, it's just a lot. And uh, when I got the scholarship for Nequeso, it gave me like four days to take some time for myself. And uh, it was really great. Because in class, you learn so much about what's going on in the world, um, definition of words, like you work on, on your on stuff that it is very important, but you don't have time to think about you. I, I was like so exhausted at the end of the semester. And at Nekoso, they gave me the opportunity to actually learn how to manage myself, not only my life, others' life, le uh, being a leader, all that. It's just gives you such insight, it gives me more energy to do more for other people because when you're exhausted you cannot work as well like as you would uh, if you had a lot of energy to put. So now I uh, got a job at Chabot College, I'm an instructional assistant and I'm working with students in early childhood development, finding their way, uh, their classes, uh, how they can um, make the most of college and how to get their permits and uh, what they can do to improve their experience at Chabot and basically doing counseling and stuff like that. So it's really great. Um, I did not know about AUW before I got the scholarship and I was really amazed by the work you guys do and the time you put, the money you put for forward for, for women. Just um, It's really hard in this world that we're living now it's, every day is a struggle for me. I don't know how others feel, but um, seeing the work that you guys do, just um, it's really amazing. Uh, I discovered the Tech Trek uh, girls, mm -hmm. and it was amazing to hear these young ladies talk about their dreams and what they want to do. And just being part of the AU family um, is just wonderful. So I wanted to thank you guys for the scholarship to make me um, discover AUW, what you do, and I hope I can uh, live up to expectation and do more for the, for the, for the group. That's, um, that was amazing. Thank you very much. A couple of you have mentioned Tech Trek, including Marie, and I'd just like to give her a shout out. She actually was the founder of the AUW California Tech Trek programs back in 1998. <laughs> She did that with a community action grant. And um, the camps have become so popular, there are 10 in California, or is it 12? 10. 10 in California. It's such a successful program that AAUW National began to start camps in other states. And last year, they actually took over the administration of the Tech Trek program for California. So all of our donations now go to National. Um, the first camp was at Stanford, of course, and then it expanded. I, I kind of mention this because even though we don't have any community action grant recipients here today, I know some of you have received them, Sally Ann Berenson, 
received one for bully, a bullying project. The Stockton branch had a gender equity roundtable about hmm, 15 years ago or so, and I'm sure there's other branches in here as well. And I mention it because I encourage you, if you have a project or your branch does, to apply for one of those grants. They're awarded to individuals, uh, branches, states, or nonprofit community groups um, that have programs or non-degree research projects that promote equity and education for women and girls. So I do encourage you to apply for those. Uh, Donna Mertens would like to say a few words to you, I think. I have really enjoyed being here today, and I applaud all of you for coming out and hearing our fellows speak. To me, this is the most exciting time of the year for us. All the time that we work to raise the money that we do, we get to see the results, and that's so exciting. I just have one plug. I would like to um, ask you to consider becoming a state director. I have to tell you, out of the 12 positions on the state board, only three are from Northern California. We need more Northern California participation. And it isn't hard. Take time and think about it. And as Jean said, everything's on the website. Please consider applying. Thank you very much. I am the national, national representative for Northern California for Legacy Circle. You may have seen these pins around the room. There's a number of people. In, in Northern California, there are 60 of us who are members of Legacy Circle. What does that mean? It means that we've taken the time to put in our will or trust a gift to AAUW in one way or another. It can be done a lot of different ways. The way I did it at the beginning was I got a gift annuity, or I get money every quarter from AAUW for the money that I gave them those years ago. In addition, you could put your life insurance policy or a part of it in it. You can put part of your IRA into it. But it needs to be written into your will or your trust that you are leaving this to AAUW when you die. Knowing that AAUW has been around for so long, I don't want to see it end when I'm not around anymore. I want to see it continue. So you can see it's very important to all of us to think about putting a legacy into your will. There's some information back there by the AAUW Legacy Circle Board that I have. My card is there. You can get in touch, touch with me easily. I'd be happy to talk to you about it. There's no minimum. You don't have to put $10,000 in. You can put a small amount of money in. So remember that there is no minimum to it. You can do it a variety of different ways. And I would be happy to talk to any and all of you about this. I really feel strongly about it. Thank you. I'd like to applaud these young women once again. They're wonderful examples. Thank you so much again for coming. This is always my favorite event, so thank you.